Ladies and gentlemen, let's talk about the modern transistor, process shrinking, and keeping up with Moore's law, shall we? Let's face it, we're always talking about NM, nanometers, and with the recent video of the upcoming die shrink of AMD's Ryzen next year, the link of that video will be in the description, it seems a pretty good topic, particularly in light of the chairman of MediaTek, Sai Ming Kai, who has said that he believes Moore's law will only be able to last a few more generations, essentially slowing down when we hit 3NM node. So the question is, why is this, and is there anything that we need to worry about? I'm here with a quick message from this video sponsor, ICO Backers. Cryptocurrency has been a very hot topic of late, and we have an interesting new contender, CrowdWiz, which had an exciting launch on the 20th of November. CrowdWiz is like a community-run investment fund which makes use of an ICO, which lends it more security thanks to blockchain technology. CrowdWiz is a highly anticipated ICO and is off to a great start with a successful pre-launch. Unlike other investment funds, it uses the wisdom of the crowd to decide direction. If you're interested in dipping your toes into the cryptocurrency waters without worrying about learning everything there is to know about the world of cryptocurrency, CrowdWiz is here for you. They currently have investment bonuses available until December the 8th, so if you want more details you can click in the link in the video description or you can stick around to the end of the video for more information. This video is intended as an overview. <laughs> Frankly this topic is pretty complex and the aim here is just so that we all get on the same page and it's handy for me to link back to in the future. So firstly let's establish a few basics before we proceed. What is a transistor and a process? Virtually all technology that we use today, from your smartphone to your new Xbox One X or your high-powered PC, or even your bank ATM, transistors are the building blocks of these devices. They're typically comprised of semiconductors, and in the case of the technology we discuss on a daily basis, are made out of silicon. To clarify, silicon is found in sand, and is known as a semiconductor because it's neither a natural conductor, like, say, a piece of copper wire, or an insulator, like, say, rubber. Silicon is then treated with various chemicals. This process is known as doping, which turns it into a positive P-type or a negative type, also known as N-type. They function in two ways, either as an amplifier or a switch, but we'll be discussing the latter since we're on the subject of computing. In other words, we'll be discussing a switch. Transistors work in binary, and thus can store two different numbers, either 1 or 0. Given memory or processors that are now comprised of hundreds of millions or even several billion transistors, this is how they can store and process so much data. Rather than eating up all this video on how a transistor functions, just know that a field effect transistor, FET, there are three different terminals. A source, a drain, and a gate. If a positive charge is used on the gate, electrons can flow between the source and the drain, and thus the transistor is turned on. And once again, sometimes billions of transistors are used in modern day CPUs and graphics cards along with memory and other such devices. And thus, with arrangements in complex configurations, they are capable of calculating a lot of stuff. So what then is a process node and how does it relate to the size of transistors? A semiconductor process is a series of lots of steps to make an integrated circuit, say a CPU, which fall within a specific performance and size characteristics. Process nodes are simply a standardised process which is used across a wide swathe of products. When we refer to 28nm, 14nm and so on, we are generally referring to the device's half pitch. This represents half of the distance between a feature on a transistor and the very same feature to the transistor which is directly neighbouring it. At least that's the theory. In reality, different parts can actually be manufactured at different sizes so it's likely better to consider the number as, say, a milestone of sorts from a manufacturer. Indeed, global foundries and other silicon producers are notorious for having a rather unique spin on process sizes. In regards to their 14NM process, global foundries vice president of advanced technology architecture, his name is Subaramani Kanjiri, famously said, the first generation FinFET is basically reusing all of that and plugging in FinFET into the framework. It's really a 20NM FinFET in a way. In other words, essentially it is using exactly the same process, but because it's utilizing FinFET, they just are saying it's 14NM as a way to, well, differentiate it. 
This process was slated to start production back in 2014, and for the record, AMD and Intel are currently using different implementations of 14nm. The rumours, and they could change as of late 2017, is that AMD are planning to shrink Ryzen down to 12nm in 2018, while Intel are looking to introduce 10nm with IceLink. So what is Moore's Law that we hear so much about? Born in 1929, Gordon Moore was the co-founder and chairman of Intel. Back in 1965, Moore was working as the director of research and development at Fairchild Semiconductor. He was asked by Electronics Magazine to make a prediction of what would happen over the next 10 years in his field, and this article was published in April 1965. He observed that the number of components, transistors, resistors, diodes, or capacitors, in a dense integrated circuit had doubled approximately every year. He believed that this would continue for a minimum of at least 10 years. So, 10 years later, in 1975, he made another revision. This was that he said that the rate would reduce to every two years, and since then the industry has been struggling to keep up with this law. I wonder if he knew just how profound it was, the statement he made back then. Okay, so what is the problem? Well, electrons have a pesky downside. They can penetrate barriers if those barriers are thin enough. This is known as quantum tunneling, and as chip makers have packed more and more transistors into spaces, and those spaces between the regions have decreased, electrons can sometimes pass through regions they just shouldn't. Indeed, trigates and multigates have done their part in improving the gates in transistors and reducing leakage, and companies such as Intel and Nvidia have already implemented them with great effect in their chips for the past several years. If you reduce the oxide gate too much than more than a nanometer, for example, electrons can pass simply right through it. This gate, as we've discussed earlier, is responsible for turning the transistor on and off. So, if the transistor can't be open and closed reliably under controlled conditions, then it's not going to serve its purpose. Obviously, leaks and dud silicon have been long part of chip production, and thus one of the reasons that binning is a thing for chips. If chips which are produced have imperfections in, say, a core, who can't run at a specific clock speed, then Intel or AMD or NVIDIA can simply bin those chips for a lower performance part. For example, if you have an 8-core Ryzen 7 CPU, has a core which doesn't work, no problem. You could simply move it down one rung on the ladder and sell the CPU as a Ryzen 5 6 core. With that said, process shrinks will continue to happen, and it might just mean that we start altering how we produce silicon or we bring different materials into the mix. In fact, back in 2002, IBM produced a 6nm transistor, while in 2006, a team of researchers from the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology and the National Nanofab Center developed a 3nm transistor together, which was the smallest device created using FinFET. In 2015, Intel described a lateral nanowire, or gate all around concept for 5nm, and in 2016, researchers at the Berkeley Lab created a 1nm gate, using MOS2 as the channel material and carbon nanotubes were used as the invert channel. Okay, so now we know what process size is and what a transistor is. So what are the benefits of shrinking down in size? Well, for one, chips require less energy and obviously take up less size. This in turn, with a reduction of energy required, reduces the heat which can be produced, and of course you can pack more transistors and more stuff in the same space. Since questions on my rise and die shrink video prompted me to make this video, I decided to use the Zeppelin Octocore die from AMD's Ryzen as a test example. It is produced on a 14nm process, comprised of 12 metal layers, 2,000 meters of signal, 4.8 billion transistors, and comprises a total area size of 213mm. Of course, we don't know exactly what AMD will be changing for the new revisions of Ryzen and its die shrink, but it's possible that we could simply take the figure of 213mm, reduce it by about 10%, 14 to 12 after all, and you can see the chip die will shrink, will likely mean that we're looking at a chip that's around 180 to 190mm. This is with a healthy dose of speculation, and assuming AMD don't do any tweaking of the layout of the chip itself. For all we know, they could decide to spend this additional size and additional cash, extra logic inside of the chip, or perhaps even make the die slightly larger in future revisions of Ryzen, 
and plonk in additional cores, although this is more likely to be in the distant future, not for Pinnacle Ridge, also known as the Rise and Die Shrink. There is also a lot of discussion on quantum computers, and they do have many exciting prospects, but a number of drawbacks. The first and most obvious is, well, they don't have the technology which has properly been invented yet, and I don't just mean the hardware either. Even programming the thing is going to be a lot harder than currently with traditional computing. Traditional computers, as we've discussed earlier, work on a binary basis. Quantum computers work on qubits. And therefore, it's not just yes or no, value, as in one or zero, instead there's a lot of values in between. Another issue, and something that scientists are obviously working on, is that a fun thing about quantum mechanics is that by observing it, you're changing the event or outcome. This is very hard to verify in a quantum computer, and whether it's functioning correctly. To put it a simple way, imagine that by watching you type in 1 plus 1 into the calculator, yeah, the result might be 2, but it might not be. It might be 3, or it might be 4, or hell, it might be 2.111. But because the math, equations, and programming are in the infancy right now of quantum computers, all we can say is that they're right in theory. So what do we take away from all of this? Well, hopefully you have a fairly reasonable understanding of the tech verbiage that's constantly used throughout various videos produced on this channel, and of course generally throughout the internet. Secondly, don't worry about silicon. It's not going anywhere yet. We as a species will continue to adapt, tweak, and refine our development of chips introducing carbon nanotubes and other solutions to continue advancement of processes and other technology. Oh, and while it's outside the remit of this video, there are other techniques which companies such as NVIDIA, AMD and Intel are using, such as developing chips which are almost like pieces of Lego, which can fit together with ink cats. We've done a lot of discussion on this previously, but with the adoption of this technology, it allows easier development than a single monolithic die where everything is created on one large piece of silicon. For AMD, this technology is known as Infinity Fabric, and is used in various Ryzen processors, including Epic for servers, and the Vega GPU. Intel have the mesh, known as EMIB, which debuted on the desktop with Skylake X, and is designed to do much the same. NVIDIA certainly aren't being left out either, and as of late June 2017, released plans and details of their own multi-chip module designs. This design, according to NVIDIA, is almost 50% faster than the largest implementable monolithic GPU, within 10% of an unbuildable and hypothetical monolithic design GPU, and optimized MCM GPU is 26.9% faster than an equally equipped multi-GPU system. Computers have long had to change how they're designed, and if you've been following PCs in particular since the early 2000s, you recall you had all the processors which only had a single CPU core for the desktop. Eventually we started to see AMD, then Intel introduce multi-core processors, because CPUs couldn't continue to evolve in terms of single core performance due to limits. We've discussed those in previous videos, and you can find a link to that in the video description. While this situation is of course different than clock speed and single core performance scaling, the message behind it remains clear. Performance won't be stalling anytime soon, so don't worry. If you like this video, please consider giving it a thumb up and subscribing for more content. With all of that said, hopefully I'll see you around soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now. Thanks so much for watching the video. Your support is always appreciated. If you're still here, it's because you want to know more about CrowdWiz. As mentioned at the start of this video, CrowdWiz is based on Wisdom of the Crowd, which means you get to vote alongside the rest of the community on the future of your investment. They use the collective opinion of a community to make the investments in cryptocurrencies easier and safer. You can find out everything there is to know at crowdwiz.io, and I've put the link in the video description. If CrowdWiz is something you're interested in getting involved in, there's a 5% bonus sale available if you sign up until December the 8th. Each Wiz token is worth $1, but if you sign up before December the 8th and buy, for example, $100 worth of tokens, you would get $105 worth of tokens. Find out more and sign up in the link in the video description. And thanks very much for watching. Take care of yourselves. And once again, thanks very much to the video sponsor. Bye for now.